Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the real Robin Bradley Bombs. is dropping. It is Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today in the studio, I've got a real, actual badass. <laughs> David Meltzer's in the house. Welcome, David. Oh, I've never been introduced that way, but I love it. I call my 17-year-old a badass, so. Well, dude, you're a badass. <laughs> Nobody can argue with that, right? <laughs> you got you. the You got the stats. You got, you got the proof. So you told me earlier you had your last birthday. So when when did you start being a badass? Did you grow up rich? No. I'm five years old. My dad left, six kids, single mom. And I think that was the first time I at least knew I had heart uh, because I wanted to be rich. I only wanted to be rich to buy my mom a house and a car. That, that's where that first, you know, I'm unstoppable attitude happened was I just looked at my mom. I, I, I don't feel sorry for myself. I had two bedroom apartment. We sometimes had food stamps, but I was really happy. Maybe I was just stupid, but I was really happy. The only time I realized I had this fire was I caught my mom crying. She sacrificed everything, two jobs, and I caught her crying because we didn't have enough money. The car broke down, and I still get choked up talking about it because I was sitting there going, oh, F this. How old I, I were you? I was five. I started, I remember at five years old catching my mom crying because the car broke down and telling myself, this is not going to be my life, like for her. like So I was going to be rich to buy a house. Were you... Were you Youngest or oldest? I was middle youngest. So I had older brothers and older sister and two younger brothers. And uh, my youngest brother was literally just born when my dad left. And just, they were all, they, I still call them parents wet dreams. Every one of my siblings, my mom's an educator. All of them went to the Ivy Leagues. Harvard, Penn, Columbia. My younger sibling was summa cum laude at Harvard. I mean, incredible students. And I was a good student. I mean, compared to other people, they probably would say, oh, you're a really good student. But compared to my siblings, I thought, you know, I was drooling my way to, to college. Who's doing the best out of the siblings? Yeah, well, financially. I, I am. Yeah. Now, isn't that crazy? Because, again, I dropped out of school at 16. People, or, yeah, well, not 16. 11th grade. Yeah, 16. Which, you know, was stupid. I wish I would have, you know, I'm summa cum laude and all this shit. But, <laughs> you know, I hit, the, I hit the streets like an idiot because I got kicked out of my house at 16. And, of course, started making great decisions. What 16-year-old kid with a 77 Camaro, all tricked out, is going to go to school? And if you did, you're just going to get some. Yep. So so I made some <laughs> stupid decisions, never went to college. But yet, I always tell people I've got, I think, three or no, four MBAs and a PhD. I'll introduce them to you right after we get done here because they're over there in the other side of the building they just work for me yeah i get it I'm it's crazy though like <laughs> I, is college is an education unless of course you're trying to be a doctor lawyer is college necessary to succeed what do you think no i don't think especially nowadays i think you know attitude is necessary and the attitude to learn wherever you can find those things uh you know today you know what I, that was yeah that bomb baby yeah because listen <laughs> this whole thing i forgot to explain because you're probably not a listener i am believe it or not but oh good, right. good. Yeah. well what well listen that just means hey listen better listen up people because what you just said was important dude attitude is massive massive i know someone with the right attitude that kills it and you know Nick San Anastaso? Of course, yeah, I mentor him. Dude, that's a freaking attitude right there. Right there. It's <laughs> proof. Come, come and see me next week. You're a great kid. Like, dude, every time someone bitches, me, me, I think of Nick. And I say, dude, STF you. Get out of my face. Like, that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. This dude has a finger. He don't even have a hand. Right, yeah, one finger. And he's running around snowboarding and speaking and writing books and nothing stopping the kid. That's attitude. Yeah, and that attitude, the reason you need it is because it's not... Uh, where you get you access your information it's not where school is a place that you can do it and some people appropriately align with that type of methodology for me i look at two things one like nick productivity how much value am i bringing to the world and then two where am i accessing the inspiration and the education that i need so there's a duality to accessibility but productivity and accessibility is the lens in which my attitude is focusing on what i want and that's how i 
what I believe allow things to happen in my life. And that's why I think financially I'm far more successful and have been twice in my life than most people. So if someone was out there with a little bit of pain financially, what would you recommend they do? First of all, ask for help. Uh, totally There's different. There's another one. Like <laughs> people don't do that. You know what? They're macho and they've been told you want something done, do it yourself. I say the other day, too many people are out there trying to figure out what they need to learn. And I said the other day, dude, a lot of people don't need to learn anything. They actually need to unlearn something. Their mind or their education or their upbringing has taught them something. And that's what's stopping them from excel, from, you know, from excelling. Yeah. Limiting beliefs are created in two ways that create what I call an unconscious competency. The first is gen genetic. Right? We have certain personality traits, characteristics, obsessions, and addictions that we carry down from four generations that limit us. So we have to unlearn that type of unconscious competency. And then we have an un energetic unconscious competency that is mystic in some nature, but it's really not. We attract by the energy and value that we put out exactly what we put faith into. And if, until we shift our energy and we put faith into something different, we're going to keep getting the same obstacles, voids, shortages, the same people, the same problems, just different faces, different sizes, and different forms. But the same stuff keeps coming to people because they don't understand how their unconscious competency is limiting what they have. And that idea of change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's why for me, I go and look at radical humility. I'm going to ask one question of almost everybody I meet. Number one was actually two questions how can i be of service which we met before and i think you get the thing my initial reaction is how can i help you man two do you know anybody that can help me now i've exponentially grown help not to specifically say look brad i know you're really good at this can you help me but bigger than that brad do you know anybody that can help me which is inclusive of you so now i've you know millions of people probably i have exponentially grown my connectivity my power my source by asking for help yeah, well, I totally buy into that. However, <clears throat> if someone approaches that too quickly, y y it's not going to work. We got to bring value. You got well. You we, there. You go. You got to bring value and or build a relationship. Because if I just met you and I'm like, you know, hey, you know anybody that can help me? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. People be like, uh. that's a good point because I get a little, little bit ahead of myself. So re re reality, how do we how do we do that? Right? You have to connect emotions. Well, you already said it earlier. Uh, I thought you did anyway. I believe you build relationships by helping you like, right. like being honestly, sincerely interested in helping you. And I, and I'm a proof of it. Um, up till I was about 30, I just wanted to be a millionaire. I just wanted to be a multimillionaire. <laughs> I want to be rich. I want to have the cars. I want to have the houses. I want to, I want to be the cool guy. And all I ever did was worried about me. Now, again, keep in mind, this is just, I'm a normal person. I'm not studying self-help books. Like I had to learn everything the hard way. That's why my book, when it comes out, it's called the hard way. I like it. It's the lessons I learned the hard way. So you don't have to. So I did this like a dumbass. I wish I would have had mentors and coaches and shit. But, uh, up till I was about 30, all I wanted to do was be rich. And it was all about me. And then about 30 years old, I helped this kid in the back. I, I ran a car dealership and there was this lot porter in the back. Mexican dude, you know, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, just a cool dude. And I said, come here, let me show you how to sell cars. Cause he was broke all the time. Right. You know? And I'm like, let me show you how to sell cars. Let me show you how to close deals. Let me show you how to flip, flip people to leasing. And so I worked with him for about two, three months and he started going from minimum wage to 12, 15 grand a month. He went on to run the store, like make hundreds of thousands a year. Um, but it just hooked me, man. His whole life changed. His yeah. his wife's life's changed. Their eyes were different. They they walked different. Their kids were more proud. And it was amazing transformation. And I went, dude, that feels good. And I didn't even know that I did it, but I just thought, how do I help people do? I want to help people make more money. I'm going to start a training company. I'm going to start teaching people how to do that. And dude, that led to where I am today. And if I didn't do that, I'd probably be some old schmuck freaking car guy sitting there smoking cigarettes on a car lot, waiting for the next customer, wondering how I can get rich. Yeah. So it's true. It works. You need to worry about helping other people. And Zig Ziglar, I had the fortunate, uh, I had 
was very fortunate to work with him a little bit because he's on our platform or was still is, but right. you know what I mean? <laughs> Virtually. <laughs> yeah. And he's the one that taught me and he told me and he tells everybody the best way to get what you want is to help others get what they want. When he said it, I was already on my journey and it really resonated. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so that quantum shift that I call that, it stems from three worlds and understanding how this works. And this is how I ended up losing, I ended up losing over a hundred million dollars because I had that same attitude. Wanted to be rich, everything was for me. Now, I thought it was better than everyone else because I saw people as victims. I used to say, that guy lives in a world of not enough. I live in a world where it's, everything can come for me. I, I know if things seem hard, it's just for something better's coming for me. But there's only so much of me. What you just explained is the key to life. And it's the idea that I live in abundance. I live in a world of more than enough where everything comes through me for the benefit of others. When you understand mm, that, like that when you become a vessel... When you become a vessel, the, the universe isn't even big enough to contain what you can have come through you. There's only so much of you. That's why. Well, most... how do they decide who gets to be the vessel? Well, you decide, in my opinion, who gets to be the vessel. No, I believe that most people are shallow or empty. When, when I was a multimillionaire in my 30s, I lied in bed in my big home in Rancho Santa Fe, Ferrari, Porsche, beautiful wife, three daughters at the time, gorgeous. I have a little boy now. But I remember sitting for the first time in my life and looking at the ceiling going, Oh shit, I'm unhappy. I, my whole life I never had this. I could buy whatever I wanted whenever I wanted. And so I started buying more, all for me. So, so what's your question about, does money buy happiness? Money gives you options. Many more options. Yeah, but does money happiness. buy happiness? Not directly, but it gives you options to be more happy. Well, can we debate a little? Yeah, I would like that because I I'm real close on this. I have very finite definition. Well, let Keep me going. let me let me close you Good. on another angle. I like it. Uh, if your wife wants something and you're able to get it for her, does that make you happy? When if my wife wants it, sometimes, yeah, it does. If your children want something and you're able to get it for them, does that make you happy? If I have the capability of giving it for them, yes. Doesn't mean I have to give it to them, yeah. No, no, we're not talking about that. Okay, good. Because yes. like I Having just, the capability- I just think this. to myself, because I'm a literal guy. Sometimes yeah. sometimes I, 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 am, <laughs> I am called literally. I like that. Because it's just not literal. ugly, literally. It's like Gary V, dude, and the patience thing. Like he says, you should have patience, dude. I totally disagree, but I know what he's saying. What he what he's trying to say is things take time. You have to understand that. Great, that's not patience. Patience is the ability to experience challenge, delay, and suffering without being upset. Who would want that? Like, dude, if you're delaying me, I should I shouldn't be just chill about it. If you're if you're impatient, people think that's negative. Impatient simply means. You're, there's urgency right well dude you want urgency with action i think you should be you patient. increase your actions right patience perspective wise but your actions should be with complete compelling interest there you go I, I, well you right. you just have an eloquent say, shit, yes, I, way of saying exactly my, I, I, same I, thing. I access my information at those schools we hated yeah. <laughs> harvard you went to yale and i went no. to, i went to jail <laughs> yeah but, but i love know, that either way and by the I way jail it. is a school it's a great school and there's some, i don't want to visit though <laughs> there are some highly intelligent into uh innovative emotionally, emotionally intelligent people dude, especially dude i went to jail one time for a dui oh and i had to be there like four or five days because it was on a weekend Ooh. and there were people in there figuring out how to get this note six cell blocks away or you know it was like how the hell right. and they figured it out and right. it's like dude this one guy came up wants some apple pie i'm like where'd you get apple pie <laughs> i made it in the, i made it in the microwave i'm like Tell the truth. Right. And dude, this dude went around collecting people's apples that they didn't eat. Next thing you know, he's doing something. Boom. He'd baked up like an apple pie, an unbelievable apple pie. That's Sk awesome. Hey, dude, jail, just like selling cars. Dude, that's a boot camp. People always say, should I sell cars? Shit, yeah. Like if you don't know sales, sales, I selling agree. cars is an unbelievable boot camp. You get all the hard, you know, thick skin, rejection, all that crap. I, I, I uh, diverted. I That's wanted okay. to say something important, and then I freaking ran off on a <laughs> on stupid tangent. tangent. We were talking about patience and... and uh, yeah, patience. Yeah. And more importantly... We are going to argue a point, though, I think. Uh, money buys happiness. Yes. Let's get back to the real. That's where I want to go. Good. Because people say money doesn't buy happiness, and I say, yes, it does. You just don't know where to shop. Then people always say, well, my brother had millions of dollars, 
and he was depressed and you were just going down that track where I had everything I wanted and I wasn't happy. Yeah, but it wasn't because you had money. Right. Oh, I didn't say and that. And you would have been 10 times more unhappy without <laughs> money because trust me, you probably would have. Yeah. And people hear what you say and then they hear what their parents said. And, and I'm telling you, there is a subconscious block in people's head against money and I believe it. it's blocking them from money. I agree. And I, I agree with that. Let me give a clarification. So I believe my motto in life is make a lot of money, help a lot of people, have a lot of fun. Without making a lot of money, we live at this vibration, this pragmatic world. There's an ethereal world where you can walk the streets of Calcutta giving away everything that you have like Mother Teresa and have a fulfilling purpose. If you have money and you have this attitude about the money, this energy, this perception, you can be far more fulfilled, purposeful, passionate, and happy than ever before. But I believe there's people out there, including me, when I lost everything, that all of a sudden I understood my pursuit, my happiness was derived from this, the enjoyment of the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of my potential. I can be happy pursuing my potential now there may be a, i think that did you just say that's what makes you happy that is the definition of happy for me when i enjoy the consistent persistent pursuit of my potential that that to me is the definition of happiness but there's a reality of this world money buys me better health money buys me better family money buys me better education money buys me better experiences how can we deny that money can't enhance that happiness but i think the nuance that we're uh, struggling with is you can have a ton of money and not enjoy the pursuit of your potential. You, sure. you, you can lose your passion and purpose and all that money in the world does won't ever buy you happiness. If you don't have what I just said, that enjoyment of the pursuit. Do you think that that hole and that void everybody speaks about is that? I, I think the void is about putting faith in the wrong things. They don't understand ego and the trajectory that they're moving on. The idea of pursuit is that I'm directly pursuing what I want. I think the happiness is derived by, I want this. The ego says, I want it. I, I don't get it. I'm not happy. I want it. I get it. I'm happy. Yeah. Right? We it, Food, whatever it is. So what happens to people is they allow void shortages and obstacles, the ego, the need to be right, the need to be offended, the need to be separate, inferior, superior, fear of loss. You can be completely wealthy living in Newport Coast on a $40 million home and still be living in a world of just enough or not enough. Yeah, I've met those guys and so have you. And they just can't be happy. But I agree with you. If they didn't have money, they'd be far less happy. Yeah. On, on the scale of happiness. Yeah, well, I ask, you know, what, what what makes me happy? It makes me happy to get my kids things that they want and that, you know, probably most parents cannot afford to get them. Yeah. Most parents. Obviously, there's... And by the way, I don't even believe this 1% shit. You should see the neighborhood I live in. <laughs> I'm always wondering, like, is the whole 1% live right here? Right in your neighborhood. <laughs> everybody's rich, it seems. I can never find this this 99% where everybody's broke. Like, where are they? Right. They're not at Top Golf. <laughs> They're, they're not. You live in Vegas, man. I'm just saying, like, dude, it seems like go to everybody. Mis go to Missouri. Money. I had a friend in Ohio who told me he has a $25,000 house. Well, dude, here's my question there then. Why why don't they move out of Missouri? Thank well, you. I, don't, I don't have any money. Well, that's because you live in Missouri. Like, hitchhike out of there, end up somewhere. And, and, cause, dude, you could put me on a couch. I agree. I'll, I'll make it again. Because only one human being on earth loves change, and that's a wet baby. People are yeah, so afraid one. of change. Good ones. It's so afraid. Hey, it's a good one. It, it is. Got his good ones, they, they, yeah, I have years, years of loading up the arsenal. Well, let me convince you with the happiness, or yeah, at least please. state my case. If you if you use money to get better health care, better holidays, better vacations, better clothes, better seats, better food, you're able to get your kids and your loved ones better things, the smile on their face, that makes people happy. And I believe the highest form of expression for love is is buying somebody something or giving somebody something that they couldn't normally do. So, for example, um, you, you you love somebody and you find out they have cancer. They're scared. You comfort them and get them the best doctors on earth. Like that to me, giving that is the highest form you can feel. The, like that's the best. I always use, you know, gifts 
for some reason. I think I'm, giving's I think... the highest highest vibrating thing on earth. It's the highest truth because, and I'll tell you how it's verified. The human body secretes serotonin when you give, which makes you happy. A, a biochemical reaction occurs in your brain when you receive. Serotonin is released, and it's so powerful that anyone who witnesses giving. Serotonin is released, a biochemical action from witnessing giving. That's why you're stuck, and I agree with you, happiness is by giving. The more money you have, the more you can give. Everything that you said. So then money my, does buy happiness. Money, but here's, here's the other argument that always gets me caught. Because I agree with everything you say, except for the fact that how do you explain someone that has all the money in the world, and I know these people, and aren't happy? Because they don't know where to shop. But it's not the money that makes them unhappy. I love that. So they don't like, know how to like, give. They don't know how to give. That, that They're may, scarce. That may be exactly the case. I see. We work through this. So I, someone, so drop someone, the bomb on that. You don't. These, that's it, dude. Someone has fifty million dollars and they're depressed. Why are they depressed? Dig around. It's not the money. It's the lack of giving it in your in your mind. Yeah. It's the lack or of shop. Or where to shop? It's I love that of, analogy. Yeah. Like what would make you happy? What would make you unimpressed? Undepressed? Well, you know, I like skiing and I haven't skied. Well, then go freaking skiing. Like, what's the problem <laughs> right. here? You have all the options. But people will quick to point out that that guy's got money. He's depressed. So money doesn't make you happy. Yes, money does make you happy. It just doesn't guarantee you happiness. It doesn't teach you where to shop to make you happy. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a so, good point. Yeah, so I want to I want to like get people to unlearn. Like I'm going to let all the other gurus teach what you need to learn. I'm starting to think how can I break away from the pack and like be different? Maybe I'm just going to teach you shit to unlearn. That's like what, money doesn't buy happiness. My whole coaching practice is based off of shifting energy, change literally the limiting beliefs that you have, unlearning the ego and living your true self, your authentic frequency that involves making a lot of money. You know, that's literally, I've trademarked this thing, making a lot of money, help a lot of people have a lot of fun, which now makes even more sense to me with your explanation. Why is it so important? Because you can't give what you don't have. And that's what makes us happy. The more that I have, the more that I can give, not just to everyone See, else, folks, but more people. It's factual. <laughs> what about, about, what about if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. If, if you include asking for help is doing it yourself, yeah. Yeah, but do you ever heard that? You yeah, want something course. done right, you got to do it yourself. Yeah, oh God, that's a, that's a limiting belief. <clears throat> My dad and grandpa used to tell me that all the time. You, you do something wrong, ah, damn it, move over. Want something done right, better do it yourself. I'm listening, I'm listening. And now, for a long time, I had struggles scaling because I believed if you, you want do something done right, you got to do it yourself. You ain't got to do it yourself. That's stupid. Matter of fact, that will limit you big time. You know how many people are out there like that right now? Oh. I was on the phone the other day with somebody. I I, they, I was giving them a solution to scale. You know, they don't. They're not making enough money. Well, well, what do you, tell me about it? Well, why don't you hire a salesman? I don't have the money for that. I'm going to take <laughs> kids out of my. I'm going to take food out of my kids' mouth. They said. I said, what do you mean? First of all, a good salesman, all they need is commission. You don't even need to pay a good salesman. Right. Okay? You just give them an opportunity and let them take a piece of what they brought you. So you don't even need money, number one. Number two, why do you think hiring a salesman is going to take food away from your child? Like you, you must think there's no more money out there. The food is limited and this is all there is. And that's why it's limited. And we started talking and the whole mindset of law of attraction I said, here's proof that it works because people that think it works, it works. And the people that think it doesn't, it doesn't. You just explained and, faith. And that right there proves that it works. I agree. You just explained faith. People are so confused, whether they're watching a religious program on TV or reading a Bible or whatever they do, they think faith is only for what they hope for. And they don't realize that every day, most people, the biggest transgression that they have is they're putting faith in what they don't want. And then when they get what they don't want, they're super surprised. But you just define the laws of attraction say exactly, put faith in what you want and put the action. I, I have in that book, Connected to Goodness, I gave you, it's not just the faith side. It's, I believe in the law of attraction, but I also believe in the, and John Asaroff taught me this, the law of Goya. You ever hear of that? The law of getting off your ass. You know, when you, when, you, when you just said that, the law of attraction is not possible without action. Yeah. Because attraction. 
Yeah. Get Law it. of Goya. Fits Look, he's, right he's trademarking it right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, that is good. <laughs> I just thought of that when you said attraction, because it does take action. But guess what? You have to believe first, because I know people that don't believe, and they'll let opportunities <sighs> bypass them left and right. All day long. There, there's a saying out there that says um, a genius, or no, um, somebody will hit a target and that no one can hit, but a genius will hit a target no one can see. And that I believe the law of attraction or the lack thereof is part of that reason. I can walk into a room and recognize 16 opportunities where the people in the room are wondering when's the next, you know, paycheck coming. And I'm like, dude, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. I can see opportunities left and right that people don't even pick up on. How do you explain that? It's simple vibration. It's awareness. So here's the way physics work. And this is where accessing certain information, my clarity came is why could I see things that nobody else could? Why is it the universe loves simple? Why, why, like Ferris says, right? Look for easy. You know, why am I seeing easy all the time? Because what I realized through tutelage and meditation is that if I could increase my vibration, the truth is the the fastest vibrating thing, right? The, uh, this desk is minerals slowest than plants, animals, human sound, light, thought vibrates the fastest. And the thought that vibrates the fastest is the truth. So if I'm pursuing my truth, my potential, whatever it is, my is, I'm elevating my vibration. The people around me vibrate faster. The reason this is important is you can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than you. And so when Brad Lee walks Say into, that one more time. You only can be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than you. So if I'm pursuing and expanding my own vibration, I'm, I'm improving myself, I'm more aware. And aware, awareness to me is the most powerful gift that I can give because why? If we're truly aware, we both could be billionaires tomorrow because we would know when to buy or sell something. So we're both bright enough to ask for help. Hey man, I know gold's gonna go down tomorrow. I know it because I'm completely aware. I know it's the truth. I trust me, you and I can make a phone call right now, right down to the strip to some guy, and he'll tell us exactly how to make a billion dollars, knowing that it'll go down. Well, what we have is a heightened sense of awareness so that while everyone else around us is living in a scarce world of not enough, and they're looking day to day with limiting beliefs and unconscious competencies, you and I see with clarity, balance, and focus and confidence, dude, all you got to do is this. Why don't you see it? All you got to do is hire a sales rep or you know, create a co-marketing agreement or like with sponsorship kills me. That's one of the core businesses I have. I'm like, don't you understand? Stop trying to get a job selling sponsorship. Go and find a sponsor and take it to the, any, tell them I can sell anything in sports. Right now, I can sell you signage on the new stadium. I don't work for legends, but I promise you, if I had a car dealership that wants to give me a million dollars, they'll give me 20% for bringing them over there. To leverage. Who's going to turn down? If someone brought me business right now and said, Melts, I got a coaching client for you. Give me 20% of the deal. At full price? Yeah, sure. <laughs> right? You brought me a deal. People can't reverse or see that simple awareness of if you have the value and bring it, ask for a commission on the other side. You know, it's funny that you say that. I agree with you a thousand percent. I was explaining to a bunch of people that had no hope of ever getting out of you know, the ghetto, mm -hmm. they were out of work, out of debt. I said, listen, walk into a mall and introduce yourself, ask someone what they do. And I'll bet you 50 bucks. You'd walk out of the mall with 50 opportunities. They go, what do you mean? I walk up to an individual. Hey, my name's Brad. What's yours? Joe, Joe, what do you do? You know, I sell sponsorships. If I could bring you a sponsor, could I get a piece? Of course. Okay, now I'm now I sell sponsorships. Right. What do you do? I groom dogs. If I brought you some dogs to groom, could I get a piece? You could literally introduce yourself at a freaking mall and have a job and have an opportunity. They're everywhere. Yeah. Opportunities are everywhere. Quick question. Where did you learn this quantum physics and all the stuff you know? Yeah. So Is that what they're teaching at college? Because damn, maybe I should go. <laughs> no. Uh this is what happened to me. I, I was surrounding myself with the wrong people, the wrong idea. And I met this medical doctor who explained vibration and then asked me. Well, was, this is scientific shit. This yeah, isn't, you oh, believe it or not. It, it's a fact. Right. I, I, my wife was very spiritual. I didn't believe in that shit. I used to tell people I came from nothing and I have made everything that I have from me for me. I'm in control of my universe. I'm, I don't have time to meditate. I'm on a plane and this. You med meditate now? Yeah. 20 minutes a day. 
Uh, I hear it's good for you. Yeah, it's good. Uh, find, I, the word meditation may be confusing to some people. What I tell people, every day you should find your center. I don't care what you want to call that. If, if it takes breathing six breaths or just give a moment to know before the day starts, this is the balance side of my hill. And if things start rolling downhill, all it takes is a, a finger to pull the car back up and hold it at the top. But what happens is people don't know where the center is. So when the car starts flying down the hill, they wait till the end of the day to stop the car and they wonder why they're run over every day. Me, when things go off center, I take a second, I put it back to center, then I start making my decisions instead of snowballing all that negative energy. So what if, so like if you get pissed off, you just say, hold on a moment, I bring yourself back to center. As quickly as possible, I try. Now, there's moments like if you have teenage daughters like I do and you come outside, I wake up at four in the morning every day and uh, her car's missing, you know. Or worse, their car's there with Billy's car. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be worse. Exactly. But, you know, it took me a little while to say, okay, why? Because I was going to call and scream, I, you know. I was going to panic, and I said, "Wait a second, why do I feel this way?" Yeah. Right. And th- this is long. T- t- this is, did not happen overnight. There's no BS. I still I get pissed. I lose my mind. My wife looks at me and goes, "Oh, Mister Enlightened, who writes all the books about being at peace? You just said that to me, you a hole." Yes, I'm human, but my goal is to as quickly as I can go back to center because I know at center I have that clarity, that awareness that you and I are gifted with. And if I'm off center, as you know, as as much as you have awareness and power, when you're not at center, when you're frustrated, angry, fearful, man, you can't do what you do. That's that's good stuff. I want to talk about those books too. Second question. How I wrote it. See, if I don't take notes, I interrupt, but then the whole interview's me talking. So I, <laughs> I like I'm like, okay, let me take some notes. That's cool. Now I gotta read what the hell I wrote. That's so cool. I like it. Oh yeah. How do people find their truth? You say, if you find your truth, like what is a truth and how do people find theirs? So to, to find your truth, you have to actually participate, right? You have to learn the lessons of the past. And for, for my truth, it comes from a simple emotion. Do I like it? Don't I like it? Does it make, right? Does it but make But what's memory? the past got to do with my truth? The past has nothing to do. You have to let go of the past. All, only thing the past has from us is the lessons in order to pursue my truth. But how do you find your truth to pursue it? Experience. Just th- through learning the lessons. Can't lesson. you just choose your truth? You can. And then it changes. It, there's four values that I look at, right? And it's really interesting. People think your whole life has to be balanced. There's personal values, my health, my family, love, integrity. There's experiential values. Man, I really like to work out. I like to travel. There's the... Uh, um, Uh, giving values like you talk to change your life and then personal values where people get confused is where's my truth well my truth is daily it's present and i say you know today my truth i need to receive today here's here's the facts that i'm living today and i need to focus 90 percent of my values on receiving i'm (laughs) you know i literally and there's some days there's some days you know what my whole day is to be of service And there's other days that it's all about my health and my personal values. And my goal is when I'm finally done that you can aggregate all of the balanced values to, hey, this guy lived a long, happy life because 25% of his total time was on each of the different values. And my truth unraveled. So the truth is basically a moving target. (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say it just keeps changing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shit, that don't sound like a truth. If you pursue that, that it, sounds like a choice. You pursue it, yeah. You, I think your truth is your choice. I, I, I thought you had something like you know, because I, I love, struggle. You thought love? It, no, I those just, are truths. No, I just struggle <laughs> finding what it is I actually want. The pursuit is because what you if want. you actually wanted it, like I know people. Oh, I just want this. If you actually just wanted that, then why are you doing this, 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 this? See, and I this? want the pursuit. Why am I here doing a podcast if all I want is money? Guess what? I already got some. Right. I don't need to be doing this. Well, do I want to go live in a house with just my family? I don't know. Like that kind of. <laughs> I mean, sometimes people say, well, "You going?" I say, "Who's going?" Oh, uh, it'd be just us, like you know, a friend or or my wife. And and people always go, "I can't believe you just said that, dude." I tell the truth. Sometimes I'm feel? not. I'm not going to Cancun with just my wife. Like that would be boring. <laughs> I love that. Now I would go down there with my wife and it and make it fun but not like for 10 freaking days or something stupid like hey if a couple of buddies are going and you know other couples are going where like we, with it's, you. it's a party well then I, it's going to sound fun 
people say, I can't believe you said that to me. That's my truth. My truth is dude. Like I like having close friends around on a trip. If it's just going to be me, my wife and my two little girls, um, it's boring. I'll, well, or, or let's make let's make it short because, dude, after a while, like who the what's going on here? I like, love your truth. I it, love your truth. It, but is that a truth? Yeah, it's your truth. So, here, so what's my truth? Like for me, for me, it's not about what is the truth. It's the pursuit of it, right? So if I'm constantly inspired to pursue my truth. It doesn't matter if it's money, it's your house, your kids, whatever it is. And my pursuits change every day. You know, I What's your truth today? You know, well, my wife is here with me. <laughs> See, so, we, but we got to, we, we need to change that word. Because to me, a truth is a constant. Like if, con- if it's my truth, it has to be like, that's the deal. It doesn't change every day. Otherwise, dude, I thought you, your truth was this. That was yesterday, bitch. So why T- is that? Today's, today's a different day. But, that, but that, to me, I believe that's okay because I'm an evolved... I'm an evolving person. And there's so many times I look at things and I'm honest about it and say, I don't know what I don't know. So today, this is my truth. But someone might teach me something or I might experience something and go, oh, shit, my truth really wasn't that truthful. <laughs> it right. Wasn't. But, would it be, but would it be a daily thing? For it me, could be. But is it? For me, because I meditate, it, it kind of is. Right. Well, I'm I, just I look, trying to find my truths. <laughs> the truths. Well, I, your truth about the way you feel the one thing that we have in common when you describe that about your family i feel the exact same way and i say things but most people wouldn't say that no and they think i'm screwed up especially i thought you're a nice guy yeah i thought you were a nice guy look i let me give you an example they're doing though they're judging you and guess what projecting okay but i always say everyone has a superpower you know what mine is my superpowers i don't give a fuck that's a great superpower. Yeah, so so I don't, I mean, I do. I care about people and I care about what, people, what people think. But no, I do. I want you to think I'm smart and cool and funny and happy. But what I don't care when it, when it, when it gets to a point, I'm not going to care more about what you think than I do. So Good. like, so like if I, my kids aggravate the shit out of me sometimes, I don't want to sit there and be a quote unquote good dad. But guess what? That's everybody's opinion of a good dad i am a good dad you know it just because i get upset and frustrated because they're loud as shit for too long doesn't make me a bad dad guess what it makes me a truthful dad (laughs) because if some other dad and i know one one that could sit there forever and play with their kids while they're screaming and i think dude you ain't raising your kids right like kids shouldn't scream like that i leave i'm aggravated even if it's your kid bottom line is this this guy is the only guy i know that can actually sit there and keep going and really it doesn't bother him but it does bother me and i say it and people go what you were just saying oh dude you you don't have any patience you're a bad guy what do you think i think that's horseshit so like for me i i actually look at things in a very pragmatic way i'll tell you even i believe you consistency is the key to exponentiality meaning even relationships so I changed my relationship with my mom, for example. My mom was projecting that I wasn't making her feel as if I love and appreciate her, which is a core to is my that, Is that equal to giving her enough? Yeah, could be giving her enough, correct. And so I started picking up, like she's asking me to do all these weird things that she easily could have someone else do, and I'm driving down to San Diego to fix something little, and I'm like, why is she, <laughs> right? I gotta prove this to her, right? And people do that all the time. I want yeah, you to prove testing. Your, yeah. right. So I said, you know what? I'm going to prove that this has an exponential result in relationships. I'm going to give my mom a minimum of one minute a day. I'm going to call, text, email her, whatever it is. But all I'm going to make sure I convey within that minute or more is I love and appreciate you. Every day. Every day. It's consistently. Boom. So sometimes I lie to her and rush off the phone. and just, oh, Someone else is calling mom because you're telling me her back hurts or, you know, the typical, but my relationship has changed exponentially because my mom feels secure because I consistently, I now put time limits to make sure my wife gets a minimum of 30 minutes a day of my t- undivided attention somehow. My son, who's eight, same thing, minimum 30. My teenage daughters, a minimum of two minutes, and I'm lucky if they give that to me. And I'm a realist. As much as you could say I'm a bad dad because I don't spend a lot of time with my teenage daughters, go ask them how much time they want to spend with me. Yeah. Right? The answer is none. Exactly. Two minutes is too much. I'm barely cool because they can go on my Instagram live at least and look cool to their friends because I know sports athletes. You know, CJ Anderson comes over to my house. All the, the boys want to come over to the house. Yeah. Right, that's the that's the value of me, and they want the check. 
but I know they love me. And eventually they'll appreciate what I do, but they don't want to spend time with me. Yeah. Would you? And I don't, <laughs> and, and, and I don't think, and I don't think that makes you a bad dad. No, but, I don't, but, I'm a great dad. But a lot of people would. Yeah. And that's judging you. And you know what I also believe? People don't do a lot of shit they should and could because of one thing, fear of judgment. Yeah, fear in general. Like, I'm not going to say this. You might think I'm a jerk. I'm not going to say this. I might lose and everyone thinks I'm an idiot. So they just don't do anything, and they just sit there their whole life wondering why they can't succeed, and the answer is because they don't do anything risky to be judged. And I don't even think they sub. I don't think they consciously know what's happening. You're right. I, and it's funny, Lee Steinberg, who was the Jerry Maguire character that we asked about earlier, right? Famous, famous sports agent. I was blessed to have him as a mentor to run his company. But I started speaking, and I told him, man, I'm nervous, like, what are these people going to think, you know? Am I wearing the right thing? Does my hair look okay? And he looked at me and said, Dave, just remember this. The only thing everyone's thinking right now is, oh, my God, I wonder what everyone else thinks. Am I wearing the right thing? It's true. It's so powerful. But yet we create this illusion that everyone really gives a shit. And if they do give a shit, they're just projecting their own problems onto me. Which which that's where my IDGAF comes from. So, so people, because I'll walk out on a stage. Bigger the stage, the better for me. Like, I feel dumb in front of nine people right. more than I do 90,000. 90, right. Like, if it's 90,000, I'm like, yeah. I love that. But I'll walk out on any stage, and it's mainly because I'm not afraid of being judged. I've been judged my whole life, and guess what? doesn't mean anything if you have integrity. If you're a piece of shit, unethical scam, you are a freaking liar, you're a cheat, well, I think that is when it starts to bother you because what if they all find out? Yeah. But I walk out with pure intention, pure, you know, I'm, I, I know I'm a good dude. I don't, I don't need you to tell me I'm one. So when I walk out there, I'm like, bing, bing, bing. Now, sometimes I leave and go, damn, I forgot to say this. And geez, I stuttered and sounded like a dipshit there. <laughs> that's me judging myself. Yeah. But that's cause I like to be, be better. better. But, but walk out on stage. I don't like it. Or I mean, it doesn't bother me. And what's ironic is whenever I walk out on stage and they tell me, you know, how I did afterwards, because apparently they asked the audience, I'm always rated a high speaker. And it's because the word authentic always gets written. Vulnerable. Down. Does that it's, come to well, vulnerable, be, authentic? Yeah, it's, Those it, are the I'm things. real. Yeah. And so I'm just like, well, your truth again, it's not a people like, well, how do you do it? It's not a talent dude. I just don't care. Yeah. Well, I don't it, care. It's funny because growing up, as I became wealthy and with the siblings that I had, it became my identity, what I had. And I used to tell myself my greatest fear was going bankrupt. And if I would have to someday tell somebody that I went bankrupt, that I had failed at the one thing, the one purpose or passion I had was making money. And sure enough, you know, I lost over a hundred million dollars and the hardest part about it. So that's another and, thing. You, you, if you lost a hundred million, you must've had few more left. Yeah. Well, yeah. Be exactly. Now, what would you rather do? Lose a hundred million and have a few left or never make a million. Yeah. And, and there's, wasn't just what, what I had left was the relationships and the knowledge and it didn't take me long at all. And people ask you, how'd you come back? But I had to walk over to my mom's house. This was the defining moment for me of understanding my, my own being. I had to walk over to my mom's house, my greatest fear and embarrassment, and this is where the shift happened, where I decided I'm going to illuminate the truth about me, and I don't give a shit what other people think. It's because I walked over to my mom's house, I'm going to choke up, and I had to tell her I went bankrupt. The only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy her a house and a car, and I now had more than I ever dreamed of, and I had to walk over, right? And I had to tell her I also made one other mistake. I never took her house out of my name. And she would have to move out of her house. I lost her goddamn house. Oh, and she wow. looked at me. And I had built it up in my mind. I didn't sleep all night. I built it up in my mind that my mom was going to cry. That she was going to, you know, shame me. Tell me I told you so. You know, because I'm so much different than my siblings. That I should have been just a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. And there you are, the failure I predicted because you tried to do something no one else did or whatever it was. And she looked at me and almost smiled and just said, oh my gosh, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? Do you need some money? And I just thought to myself, I made up this, I'm physically sick I made up this disappointment of my mother and all she gave me back was unconditional love and support that I had earned and that she didn't give a shit whether I was rich or poor. I was her little boy. 
Right. Well, that's either a smart mom or a sincere mom, or both. Right. And I'm, I think I'm blessed that I have both. And well, I, th- I meant smart meaning like she did it on purpose. Yeah. Like conniving smart, uh, yeah. but obviously it was sincere. See, yeah. But and it, it was beautiful though because I, that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to tell everybody I'm bankrupt. Right at the start, but but you were ashamed of that. I, I, at first, I was. And, what what just because what you feared everybody would think? Yeah, I thought I was a failure. I thought I had failed everyone, and I thought immediately nobody would do business with me ever again. Nobody would be able to identify with me. I'd be put into this hole of you know loser, and and they're all false. Right? I get on stage now, and the one comments that I get on those high ratings is how vulnerable, and I know exactly how you feel. I lost in 2008. I lost everything. But no one had the balls to say it. Yeah. But see, I'm uh, I, I'm in the position where it's like I'm surprised I haven't. That's like, good. Like every day, I kind of expect to <laughs> cancel, cancel. <laughs> well, I've always been taught along the way. You know, rich, rich people get rich three times before they stay rich. So you know, three times you're going to go bankrupt three times. Well, I, I keep waiting. I'm like. Well, I'm going to expect it. And by the way, that shows that when you expect something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Right. I anticipate this is going to happen, and it never has a lot of times. That's what I can't explain with that whole law of attraction, because I believe this never happened. When but you, you fe- put faith into it, right? Like, I yeah, think but do you know that difference. 90% of what you fear is never going to come true? Like when you feared your mom was going to think you were a little loser? Yeah. Didn't come true. Yeah. That's but you worries, believed it yeah. would. And worry is a wasted emotion. That that is So why nuance. is that belief not working? Yeah. That isn't that interesting? Because people ask me that all I think this might be the best question I've ever been asked. Right? Because there's a conflict. <laughs> there is. Because there's such a conflict. It's like, okay, Mr. Law of Attraction, why is it then that I truly believe this is gonna happen, good or bad, and it never does? Right? Where, where's the disconnect? And I believe it's in the action side of attraction. We still have to take the appropriate action for the failure or for the success that we're anticipating. The thing that you realize is that the anticipation does not have to include some sort of stress or worry, that that's the wasted energy. And we're better off taking that energy and putting it into the action instead of some false bravado or false illusion of worry, of fear. You know, I used to wake up early and sit in bed and things would grow arms and legs on me. They would, and I started realizing I'm exhausted by 6.30 a.m. I've been up for four. And all of a sudden, I'm like, why don't you get up and go work out? Like, you have energy. Quit worrying. That's a, that's a waste. That shit, 80% of it never happens, good or bad. Yeah. Why am I wasting my energy? And that's where the productivity of my life really started. It's like, I'm blessed with this weird energy. I may as well use it for good, not to go make myself sick. So how long ago did you start thinking of this? At 25, I, st- I was a millionaire at 25, and I started on my path with by reading the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Sure. Um, but I had all kinds of screwed up things and then uh, went through a, that spiritual, what I call the quantum shift in my life in my mid-30s where I started meditating. I always was an action guy, but I became an attraction guy. And the, I, and the beautiful thing in my life, you know, I watched the movie The Secret and I read all these books, Bob Proctor and Napoleon Hill again. and Science of Getting Rich. Science of Getting Rich. I read everything. By Wallace Waddles. You got it. What, good. what do you think of him? I like it. I like it. They it, say that's where all the rest of them came from. I, that well, book. Or Carlos Castanetis is another one. Uh, Wayne Dyer in, in the early, that's more on the spiritual side. But there's, a, a, I believe, a technology. There's math to everything. And my life changed. I, the big shift in me was this quantum shift of being and understanding value. That I, like being spiritual wasn't getting high, sitting on my mom's couch, dreaming of what I wanted. It was just getting more focused, paying attention, and putting intention and then action to what I wanted. And the real shift was I will started waking up every morning not worried about me, but asking God for ten people that could He could put in front of me that I could help. And I really meant it. I was looking every day and I just started doing That's why you're here, David. Little good deeds, man. Yeah. It's me. I'm one of the ten. I'm, you're there, man. We talked about how I'm gonna do it too, and we're gonna make millions together. Have you ever taken acid? Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I think I think acid Mushrooms are better for me, but Well, I've taken my both. My kids aren't listening. No, they are they know. <laughs> well, I, well, I've taken both. Again, I just tell the truth. If me everyone too. don't like me because I did acid, then don't like me. But yeah, yeah don't I, hire me either. I took acid. Um <laughs> And I believe it it's a mind expander. For sure. And and, and I do prefer mushrooms. I don't prefer them now. I'd freak out if I did them now. But 
I preferred mushrooms only because of the come down. Like I don't sit there and listen. Like toxic. Or just when you're sitting there in the middle of the night and you're almost twitching and, and all you hear is the evening before, you know, <laughs> trying to get to sleep. You can't. I hated that. But, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but 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 I believe it. I I, I, don't, I wouldn't That's recommend so, anyone does it. No. But I do believe it helped me expand my, my belief. I, I've always wondered, are all ri- has there any been a rich person that built wealth? That hasn't done acid, and obviously the answer is yes. But did the majority or, right or if hallucinogens? Right? Because like, what if we find out hallucinogens are in fact instrumental in 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 success? And we awareness. Start gi- and we start giving our kids at eighteen here, take that take microdose. That. What could, does it raise awareness? Right? Does it I raise it your does. vibration? I do too. And I, 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 you know, I would like it to be in a controlled environment, a safe environment. And you know what? You know what I got? I got a sheet of acid by Timothy Leary, signed by Timothy Leary. No way. Yeah, and it's and it's Jesus on a on a sheet of purple acid on the cross. Oh. And when I saw it, I'm like, that's almost like wrong. <laughs> wrong. But it was signed by but Timothy that, Leary. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll take that. Nice erase your head. Yeah. And then I uh broke it and someone stole it. Oh really? Yeah. So I don't have it. What do you think that's worth? Is that worth something? It would have been. Quick question also. You said um you lost a hundred million. Yeah. How'd you lose a hundred million? Good question. So, and did you have a hundred million, or you lost value of a hundred? Value. So, and that's a good question. So, what happened was, I I was liquid for for a good amount of millions, but I owned a golf course, a ski mountain, thirty three properties, all doing well with equity in them. I got into a lawsuit. I bought the wrong property from the wrong person. Got into a fraud situation where I was suing them, and I had a, a terrible fa- fault. I had to be right. I didn't need to be right. Instead of smart. I had to be neat. So pouring millions into a lawsuit to prove I was right. Meanwhile, always secure in the fact that I could just go ahead and borrow against the properties that I had. Well, as the economy started going down, I never asked for any help because I was Midas. I was a millionaire nine months out of law school, continue to make money, barely ever making a poor decision. You know, stocks that I bought, you know, it all averaged out. I was doing so well. My golf course, I got so lucky. Sam Sneed's only design golf course. He dies right after I design it. 2,000 acres in Virginia. Eighth best golf course in the nation. You know, shit was just flowing. Well, I go to the bank, right? I'm out of cash. Hey, I'd like to borrow against this. You know, I have all, all this. The golf course alone was valued at over $120 million alone. But, you know, hey, I, I need $5 million. Oh, no, sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean? You know, I mean, I'm in my 30s. I really don't have any true education or help. I just have experience. And I always thought if you have equity in a property, banks had to get had to give it to you. This was a fatal <laughs> too. Yeah. yeah. I went to law school. What a moron I am. Like I never, I just figured why wouldn't they, right? I didn't understand. Well, I, would, the, I would believe the same thing. Why wouldn't they? Right. Why, why they? wouldn't they? Because properties are going down and the banks are failing. And why would they extend credit to you when you owned all these other properties and they're worried about your liquidity and right? Qualifying for the loan wasn't like when you qualified well, because the first time. Be, well, here's the answer. Subprime lending. <laughs> No, but here's the answer. Because if I default, you can have the property. Exactly. They made money off of me. I, I went bankrupt and people made tons of money. I, yeah, but I would think a bank, if I, had, if I had a diamond that was worth $30 million to somebody but not at the pawn shop, well, then it's not worth $30 million. Like, But if you can go anywhere and get a million for that, it's worth a million. Right. So I always see that as equity in a house. So so maybe it was the similar to the well. Who says there's a million equity? It, well, it was. But a, I would have never. I would have never guessed they wouldn't have lent you the money either. And then when I went looking for it, my credit and the fear went up. Right, the economy kept going down, properties kept going down, and as I was hitting my credit and asking for money, I looked more desperate, and I still had a huge nut. Right, I had huge flow that I needed. So my cash, and then you know, where everything was moving. I, I had some credit, right? How, how important is cash flow? So important. If you, it starts if, to get scary. If you're not cashing up right now, if you're not cashing up, Sidney Frank I worked with, he created uh, Grey Goose Vodka. He told me the best thing I ever heard. When the guy shining your shoes starts giving you business advice, stock advice, house advice, sell, cash up. Right. And that's what's happening right now. I got, I do, you know, the elevator pitch show with people pitching me ideas and I have two funds that I'm in. I get a lot of deal flow and watch a lot of companies. There's companies coming in front of me for, we've already raised $4 million. And I literally can tell you that they're going to fail. 
They haven't thought through and money is flowing. It's time right now to go cash up so you can either buy property or businesses or whatever it is in a few years when from it now. Tanks. When it takes. Because it will. I've, I've been here twice now and I'm not taking this time. What about Bitcoin? I'm not a big fan. I'll tell you why. Because I don't have enough time to truly understand it. But Warren Buffett himself... I, I stuck to looking at him, and when he says that the regulations, the government, the idea of it right now is not its time, and it, it is completely volatile, I don't need that. I put most of my money in 100% guaranteed annuities, because here's the key to what I do, and you're the same way, Brad. It might be good advice for you. I've never had trouble making money, and somebody told me, let your money make money. Well, you know what happened? I effing could make tons of money. I started putting into real estate and equity. Well, all of a sudden, I started focusing on stuff I wasn't good at. And now I'm spending all my time worrying and analyzing all these real, like all this stuff. And I'm like, moron, all you're good at making money. What if you just focus on tw making twice as much as fast as you can and putting it away in something that was guaranteed and just letting that grow at a, at a nice compound rate? What's a nice compound rate? You know, for me, I I buy IULs, which is 2% guaranteed no matter if the market goes up or down. Has upsides of about 16% when the market was doing well. But here's the kicker that most people don't understand. It has a reset. So I actually will do better. In the next two years, the market may drop significantly, and I'll get 2% each year. But since it's reset, I now can get the whole upside when it recovers. So those are the types of things that I look for. So if I can make 5 6% on average, but over here, double the amount of money that I make twice as fast by making money, how much interest am I really making? Tons. Right. Instead of making the same amount here and maybe losing 50%, going up 200% of what I already have, why not focus in on the inflow and save, save what you, you've made? And yeah. I say pay yourself first, by the way. A guy who's gone bankrupt, pay yourself first. Richest man in Babylon. I, you read that book? Yeah. Dude, everyone, You're well read for a guy that didn't go to college. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. You're like Matt Higgins, you my don't, favorite GED. Uh, you don't, head of REC <laughs> Ventures, man. You, I got to get together with Matt Higgins. Listen, you don't need um, to go to college to find books. But you do. to, to And get by a good, the way, the books there aren't even the right books. Yeah. If you want to party, though, and have a good social life, I think college is a great place to acclimate a good person. thousand portion. percent. And my girls, I hope. I, my girl, my oldest is at Tulane on a scholarship, and I tell her all the time, because you get straight A's. I said, let me just tell you this. I know this from my brothers and me. It takes half as much time to get all A's and a B because <laughs> that one class is always as much work as the other five easy ones or whatever it works. I'm like, can you please just screw straight A's? Go have a good time. You're only this that, age once. Someone asked if I want my kids to go to college, and I said, well, yes, um, mainly if they want to be like a doctor or a lawyer, but only for the experience that I didn't get. Yeah, I didn't even get to go to my high school prom. Yeah. So, like, I miss that shit. Like, um, you know, I would want to go to college for just that reason. The parties, the friends. And by the way, the friends. You can the be networking. lifelong friends. Yeah, but we know what relationships are worth in business. Huge. Like, you go to US. I say relationships are the new economy. Oh, I, 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 Big time. <sighs> so, go to college, look up how many alumni they have, well, and pick your school that way. <laughs> But that's why that's why I would send my kids to college. To go get the experience. Go make the friendships. Go make the relationships. Get the degree. Sure, it's not going to freaking help you. No, and the education like, won't dude, either. You can get it at the library even, or on the internet. Even normal. Like, dude, when's the last time you use the information that George Washington has wooden teeth? <laughs> Other than for a joke. <laughs> no, I mean, when have you used exactly. that? Exactly. Why, why was it so important that we learned that shit? Try trigonometry or, you know, some of the other stuff that I learned. Like quadratic equations yeah it's but think and grow rich i've read 10 times also people feel like if you dropped out you're stupid That's if someone if someone well i did get tested. bill gates did <laughs> but i did get tested before i dropped out and i was you know i'm a smart son of a bitch yeah but i just didn't uh get the the higher level education why do people confuse i tell my kids this all the time why do you confuse being smart with being a good student because I yeah. went to so much school. I know a bunch of dummies that got good grades because they're good students. Yeah, you just listen and, and, and remember and take yeah. good notes and like, you'll I, pass. I'm not egotistical, but I know I'm effing intelligent. Well, and, and I'm trying to figure out the difference between book smart and street smart because I'm s s street smart. Like, yes, you like, are. Dude, you can come in here. But and, you're also book smart. You're just not a good student, man. I'm also a business uh, 
maven, I think. Like, I'll talk to clients that come in here because they do VTs for whatever reason. And I'll say, so your main business is this, this, this. Why don't you do that, that, that? And they're like, I never Awareness. thought of that. And all of a sudden, they're like, dude, I've tripled my revenues. And I'm like, dude, I should I should coach people. Like, But then I don't have time to freaking coach people. I'll teach you how to have time. I did it just the other day, man. This, is, this guy came down to this mastermind that I was invited to. I only went because I like Coach Burt. You know Coach Burt? Yeah, Bert? yeah. Coach Michael Burt, he's yeah. a good dude. So he's you're like, surrounded with a lot of good dudes, by the way. He's Ed like, Milet's the one that turned me on to Ed's you. A he's good, a great dude. Ed's a good dude. Yeah. Um, so Coach Burt says, come on down, Brian. And next thing I know, I find out he's selling tickets to it. And I'm like, shit, right on. <laughs> so he, and, and he even paid me. I'm like, son of a bitch, this is cool. That's good. Is this coaching, by the way? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, I like this. So, so this guy came up. He said he's a home inspector. I said, cool. Um, so tell me about your business. He says, well, I inspect homes. I'm like, then what's the problem? He says, well, you know, there's not enough business. I'm like, well, why don't you just go knock on some doors? He goes, no, no, no. People only inspect their homes when they're selling them or buying them. And I said, that's it? He goes, yeah, that's it. And I said, why? I said, why don't you just knock on a door and say, sir, when's the last time you've been up underneath your house? You know what can be going on under there? You want me to get up under there? I brought my overalls and tell you what's going on like preventative type shit he said oh they won't do it i'm like because you said they won't (laughs) right and so i dude i i I basically invented a whole business model next time you ask coach burt what's what's going on with that guy he started a whole new division that's out doing his main business from houses maintenance from from home inspections for no damn reason just just because like dude if i'm in a big old fancy house and i've never been up underneath the house i bought it from you i got an inspection three years from now yeah i haven't been up under there and and i keep saying been up under there because that's what i was saying down there i had anytime i get around (laughs) the accent i'll i'll I'll, it'll draw that way so i'm like dude get up underneath the house you've been up under there after a while would you go what what about your house? Have you been up underneath? No. That's now, 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 you made if, me think. Now, I'd, if, I'd probably pay for it. Dude, if a dude's at your doorstep with overalls and a clipboard and he'll say and he'll save you could be potentially a lot of money, I'll get up under there for three hundred bucks. Do you want me to go check it out? Yes or no? Now you can do it, by the way, but there's black widders. <laughs> there's snakes. Rats. <laughs> there's rats. Yeah. I hear there's uh homeless people actually finding um shelter under people's homes have you been up underneath your house do you even know if there's bums living under there that's sweet let me go up under there 300 bucks this guy's just killing it now yeah i I, i'm not a home inspector but that's just to me common sense yeah i think i'm a business maven how do i monetize that honestly you got to scale it by the way uh, you're talking, which is masterminds, coaching, content. Bring ten at one, to one. Yeah, I mean, for, do you for, do that? Yeah. So, How do people get more of you? Because I know what they're going to do. They're going to hear this podcast and they're going to go, "Dude, I like this dude." <laughs> Where do they get more of you? At David Meltzer uh, and dmeltzer.com, first initial, last name. Two great places. You know, LinkedIn is easy, but I'm pretty uh, pretty accessible. The thing is, I do really want to be of service. So even with my coaching, Brad, this might sound weird, but you know, when I find someone that's capable of number one, doing the work and paying me a value to work with me, I always work for free for a month. I do an assessment. I don't believe, even if you came to me and say, Dave, I want you to go. Yeah, you're me. hired, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All I ask is you make a donation of any size to my charity. Uh, same thing with my books, right? I, I don't sell my book. I give it away and I pay for shipping because I know if I can understand and align with you that I can do the two things. I can teach you to be consistent I have relationship capital I can help you with and situational knowledge to change your life. And the more lives I change, I trust those laws of attraction through my action that more is coming to me. I and, believe that. And it's wonderful. Folks, and you would be great at it. Well, folks, if you're listening, he just said he'll give you his books and pay for shipping. Most of those guys will be like, hey, I'll pay for the book. You pay for the shipping. And then you find out the shipping's 10 bucks. It's like, bitch. It doesn't cost 10 bucks to ship that book. Yeah. Right or wrong? You're right. And it pays for the book and they're making money. Well, who's that stupid that they think shipping a book is 10 bucks? And how do the people... Which the- means they're making money on just shipping. And, the, you know, it only costs them a couple bucks to print the damn book. Yep. 
And how does it make you feel though? Like what I don't understand. You'll pay guys, for shipping. Yeah. If, what if a million people? Because you know, fine. seven billion people download this podcast. I, I hope everywhere. so. I got I got plenty. There's 16 people in Somalia that don't listen, but I'm gonna get them. They after. get ebooks. That's out of, out of the country. You get ebooks. I don't ship out of the country. <laughs> but in the U.S., you'll ship out books. Yeah, every Where day. do they go to request that? They go right right to usually DM me my LinkedIn or they go to my website and put a request in Folks, at dmeltzer.com. I'd get these books. I I mean, I'm telling you right now, the dude knows what he's talking about. He's not only, you know, apparently knows what he talks about. <laughs> he's proven it several times. Twice. So yeah. I know you got a jam. Otherwise, I keep talking because if you want to keep talking, I will. But we'll be back. He's starting to look at his watch. I know right. you're on a schedule. Yeah, we got to go meet your good friend, Damon John, who Folks, I'm convinced to use Lightspeed, by the way. He's already on it. <laughs> oh, see, there we go. Yeah, you're I'll too just, late. He'll still convince yeah. me. Convin- he'll yeah, convince, convince me. You. Right, I'll ask him. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah. I'll convince you. Oh, you just you give me did. When you're ready, all I want is an opportunity. You but, I, but I already know by the time you're done seeing it, there's nothing else like it. It, I've it, seen, it, it. What I've seen, I'm super impressed. Yeah, it would be, it would be, there would be no question. And now, and now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna change the business model where now I'm gonna make it a no-brainer because I got a secret plan. I'd like to run it by you, but listen, folks, go get his books if nothing else. Follow him on Instagram, social media. Hit him up with a hashtag Bomb Squad to let him know that you came from here because I had to beg him to come in. <laughs> he didn't think anyone was gonna freaking do anything. He thought, who in the fuck is Brad Lee? Uh, and wishes. so and by the way anybody that knows david that's listening to this podcast i apologize for the for the cuss words and until next time take care of yourself and help other folks fair enough <laughs>